Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for this invitation for representatives from CERN to come in to explain to you a little bit about what CERN's been doing in sort of data processing for our accelerator, which recently started up the LHC. Um, what I'll try and just explain to you a little bit today, just very briefly put into a minute or so, what is CERN, what's it doing, what are we there, what does the IT department do, and we've got quite a few representatives here today amongst you. And sort of what are the needs in terms of the computing for LHC, our latest uh, accelerator? And then what model we put in place for that over the last decade, in, in fact? And sort of, uh, you know, how does that, what's the relevance of it? How is it going to change in the future? Um, what's the importance for the computer centers, typically CERN and the other major computer centers around the world that are participating, which is computing modern? And how it will impact as well, we think, and be relevant for other scientific disciplines, not just physics. I should say, of course, that um, it's me standing here today, but this work represents the work of many people at CERN, many other collaborating institutes that are involved in the LHC program, and also a whole load of people and organizations around the world have helped develop grid technology, uh, which is a basis of a lot of what we're doing here. So just a word on CERN, first of all. It's for more than 50 years now, uh, put together in 1954, originally 12 member states in Europe. We've now grown to 20 member states. And they, you see the list here, the 20 member states, plus we have a whole host of other candidate uh, countries to join CERN and observers. And at this moment in time, CERN is moving from being a predominantly European centre to evolve to become a global centre for physics. Uh, we have, we have 2,300 staff in total. Uh, the IT department represents about 230 people, so roughly a tenth of that. And there's a load of other students, personnel that are in there as well, associates, fellows, and so on. And we have a user community, a lot smaller than Google, I understand, uh, more than 10,000 physicists around the world. Basically, these are the people that want to get hold of the data that's coming off our accelerators. Okay. Our annual budget is uh, uh, a billion Swiss francs, so today's money, that's basically a billion dollars as well. And that's paid by the member states. We're not a profit-making organization. Uh, we rely on money given by the member states to complete our physics program. And just to be clear, we're, we're doing physics research. We don't generate electricity. We don't build bombs. We don't do anything like that. We're looking into physics and the basics of physics. Okay. So here's our, our user population as well. You see sort of the member states and so on, which represent two-thirds of the population of people actually get hold of that data and using it. But you see many other countries are there as well, something about 60 something like countries all, in, all together that are actually making use of the results of CERN. Not many people know it, but CERN is a lot of one of the origins around the, the open access movement as well. So one of the founding partners there. So all the scientific publications come out of CERN are open as well. Inside the IT department, well, like many other places, we're structured in that way as well. But the IT department provides the computing resources for all the requirements inside the laboratory. And so if we go around, I mean, the first thing, most important one is the security. So part of the, apart from the, the, the management, the administration, we have security there. Security across all IT-style security, not just for the department, for around the accelerators, for all access to the sites and so on and things like that. And I'm glad to say that we have uh, uh, Luis and Antonio. Where are you guys? Stand up, say hello. The next area is user and documentation services. Now, you might say, what's, what's CERN got to do with this? But in fact, of course, we've been around for more than 50 years. We have one of the largest physics libraries online libraries that exist. Yeah. Um, and so we also distribute a lot of software which is used for um, storing repositories. So the CDS system in, in Vino, which is picked up by lots of other libraries around the world and used to manage their own repositories. This is open source software distributed, on, uh, distributed by CERN, maintained by CERN. And also all to do in this group is all to do with the audio visual system. So going around here, we see you have your video conferencing rooms. We do the same situation at CERN, but of course we have to do it not only within CERN, but across with all our partner organizations around the world as well. And so we have Carmen and Pedro from this group. If we look onto the experiment support, now this is where we're getting close to the real physics. Right? So for the accelerators, CERN owns the accelerators. We put in, in place the, the accelerator program. And then there are individual collaborations, groups of universities and research institutes come together and they build the individual experiments which are accepted to run on those different accelerators. And the ex experiment support group, their job is to make sure that those experiments can optimize and exploit the IT infrastructure at CERN to actually take their data. 
And so we have um, uh, Fernando and Edward who are from that group. Please, guys. Next is database services. Um, as you can imagine, we, are off, we, we need databases to manage and organize the science data, the physics data, the metadata that's generated or produced with that as well, but all the other data that you can imagine in, in an organization of 2,300 people, our pay slips, all our documents, all that sort of stuff, all the administration stuff, all that's done as well. And we have uh, Katrina and Giacomo from the, uh, the database group. Then we have platform and engineering services. So what this area is actually um, worrying about is essentially the massive batch system that we have at CERN, where we do a lot of processing on site. So here we have a massive cluster of Linux machines. We have LX Batch, which everybody knows and loves, which is the interactive system for, uh, for where we process a lot of the physics data. Um, and they do various other services like that as well. And we have, um, where are we? Yes, please, stand up. That's my mistake. I put your name down wrong. Excuse me. Oh, very. Well. <laughs> I apologize for everybody. Wrong name. And then the communication systems. Well, CERN is a big campus. We have many hundreds of buildings on the CERN site. It's several hectares in, in size. And, of course, inside that we have a wide, wide uh, local area network. We have a fixed uh, network, which is high-speed network to nearly all of the buildings in CERN. We have the Wi-Fi network as well. And we also have the high-speed interconnects to many other physics centers around the world. And Virginie and uh, Jose are here from the communications group. And then the computer facilities. As I said, we have a rather major computer center at CERN. And the computing facilities group are essentially operating that computer center for us. So they worry about um, ensuring that we have enough electricity inside that, that the cooling works. They also worry about the procurement of all the generations of equipment that go for that center as well. And uh, we'll come back to them later, I guess. Then. But first, we'll go on to, <laughs> we'll first go on to grid technology. We have a distributed uh, system there for processing of the LHC data, a grid system. And at CERN, we've contributed greatly to an open software uh, stack, which does, is basically called the middleware for the grid system. Uh, this has been produced through a series of years, different projects run by CERN, also in collaboration with the Europe money from the European Commission, also with our colleagues in the US and, and Asia. And we have Lawrence and Ricardo from, uh, from the group here today. And the other area, of course, is the data storage uh, services. So not only do we have disks, like you can imagine, where we store the data coming off the, uh, off the LHC experiments, but we have a hierarchical management system uh, where we have uh, tape robots where we store a vast quantity of this data as well. And uh, we have Lucas and Arna from the, the, this group. Okay. And then we finally come back to the computer centers I mentioned, and we have Eric and Zeka. So with that, we've sort of done a tour, so you know everybody here. You can ask them any questions you like. We have no proprietary secrets, so you can... So moving on to the accelerator itself. So, of course, Google promoted, thank you very much as well, promoted um, the, the startup of the LHC. And, of course, during 10, 2010 was our first major data-taking year. Here you see an aerial shot of the Geneva region. Uh, you see superimposed on top of that the ring for the uh, LHC, which is 27 kilometers in circumference. Next to that, you see the smaller ring, the SPS, earlier generation of accelerator, which is used as a, basically as an injector in towards the LHC. On the far right, you can see the, uh, the airport and so on. And at the bottom, below the, the, the concentric rings there, is the major part of the CERN uh, site. As I said, it's a big campus. And then you understand why we have a rather large local area network there as well. And of course, over this side as well, we have the uh, other part of so the Pebersan site where a lot of the fixed target experiments uh, take place as well. So it's a very large thing, and it spreads the Swiss-French Swiss border, which basically goes through here somewhere, here where the Jura Mountains, uh, Lac Le Mans, okay. and things like that. So on that accelerator, as I said, it's not actually on the surface. You can't see a painted line when you go around Geneva. It's not really painted on the roads. It's below, yeah, up to 100 meters at some points. And uh, it was actually developed, well, dug out in the, uh, about 85, was the, when it finished, 85, 86, with a previous accelerator called the LEP. We subsequently dismantled that uh, accelerator at the end of its lifetime and then built the LHC in the same tunnel. And what you see there, we'll look a bit more in more detail, but you can see some of the magnets inside the, uh, inside the accelerator. And there are four major experiments, two other smaller ones, but four major experiments sitting on the LHC today. And so here we see them distributed around the accelerator. 
So these are the points, essentially, where the, particle, uh, the particles collide, beams of particles come together and collide, and that's where we collect the data from these four major experiments. They are, in a sense, looking for many of the same characteristics, physics characteristics, but don't, uh, don't, don't underestimate, they're also in competition. Right? They're all trying to vie to do the best things as they can. They're competing amongst themselves to see who can come up with these discoveries as quickly as possible. Shot of the, of the accelerator itself, a sort of cutaway looking at the LHC accelerator. We see some of the blue parts of the magnets, and of course the magnets go all the way around, they're 27 kilometers long. So there's something like just over 1,000, 1,100 uh, magnets, uh, each one several meters long. If you look inside the magnet, you can see there are two uh, uh, beam, beam pipes here. So of course we have two, two rings circulating in opposite directions, and then they are brought to collide inside each of the four experiments that you saw in the previous shot. Yeah? So they're accelerating in that way, 10,000 times per second or more, but going all the way around. This whole mass is cooled um, for superconductivity reasons in order to have high enough magnets which we need to concentrate bend such high power beams. We need superconductivity, i.e. The, the ability to pass electricity without any uh, resistance. And to do that, the whole mass of this, some 40,000 tons, I think, or something like that, are cooled using liquid helium. There's 130 tons of liquid helium inside this machine. That's why it takes us several months to cool the machine down to work on it. We're up again. So when you go back to your flat tonight, you've been out for dinner, you had a few daiquiris, you go back home, you go into there, and you think, I'll just have a nightcap before I go to bed, and you go to the fridge, and you open the fridge, if it's exciting, it would take you three months to get that beer out. Right? So just remember that. Think about us when you go home tonight. And then you close the door, another three months. Yeah? It takes that much time because of the mass of the material we have to cool down. And it takes us, we do it by sectors, we do it uh, time at a time. The running cycle of this machine is very long. Previously, we would run for several months with the old accelerator, run for several months. Close down in the winter when we do maintenance, also when the electricity is more expensive. But now we have to run for longer periods because we lose too much time cooling the machine down, warming up. Here's just a little simulation of what it looks like inside of one of those four experiments sitting on the LHC, LHC uh, accelerator. So what it is, basically, it's a big onion ring. And each layer of that onion ring is looking at a different physics characteristic. And each one uses different materials and technology in order to do that. But all of them are producing data. Right? So what you see here is the, is the experiment, let's say it's Atlas or something like that, and here you see the beam line coming through it, and you see the two beam, uh, particles, uh, beams of particles colliding, and out of that produce other types of particles which are detected inside that machine, inside that detector. So it's pretty much like a very powerful um, digital camera. Right? Uh, these are happening, these collisions are happening at 40, 40 megahertz, so 40,000 uh, times per second, and the amount of electronics in here means that we have 150 million sensors, basically. A million pixel camera that is taking 40,000 photographs per second. And there are four experiments. Right? So you start to get an idea of how much data we're talking about, which we have to deal with in real time as it comes off these machines. So in fact, there's dedicated uh, hardware inside each of those experiments, or very, very close to them, underground, which we call the triggering and data acquisition system. So the special electronics takes it off the experiment and into the first level trigger. Depending on which experiment, you might have one, two, or three levels, one, no, two or three levels of triggering. And we take it off there, and at this point, we have some dedicated hardware, specialized custom-built hardware, sitting in racks down in the pit. And it is going through, it can't see a whole event. It can't see a whole collision. It can only see a little part of it, because the amount of time it has to make a decision is very, very short. So you can only see a little bit of it, and like a keyhole, it has to guess if that's the right sort of event we want to keep, or whether or not we're going to throw it away. It's a bit like spam. You throw most of it away because it's all spam, and we want to keep a little bit of it, right? So we'll make a selection decision, yes or no, keep it. It goes through to the higher levels of the, of the triggering. And each time, we have a little bit more time, still, of course, sub-second. We have a little bit more time, and we see a bigger part of the picture, until when we get to the level three trigger, where it's the first time we can run an algorithm which can look at all the data from an individual collision. Okay? And with that, 
We then take it from there, and after that, it's the first time it goes out to permanent storage. So we haven't stored it permanently to disk until that point. Okay. If you look at this graphic, we can see the accelerator underground. You see the four experiments. There, this is where some of the electronics are sitting. The level three trigger is sitting at the top of the event filter farm. And we have uh, fiber optic cables taking the data up to here, and then taking the selected event back to the CERN computer center. We're centralizing it there, and then from CERN, we can, we can record it, and we can also spread it around the world for further processing and to access to those many thousands of physicists that want to get hold of that data as quickly as possible. So to do that, I said we use a distributed uh, processing model because the amount of CPU we need for this is essentially we need 100,000 CPUs every day to process the data coming off the, uh, off the four experiments. Together, re we're recording about 15 petabytes of data per year off these four experiments. Recorded, not the data uh, acquired, but what's recorded. Uh, yeah. And so we have a distributed model that's built or designed basically a decade again now, uh, where we have, oh, damn it, we have CERN at the center, known as tier zero. So this is where data comes off into the computer center. So the computer center is tier zero. And we have 11 specialized centers around the world. Now, each one of these centers have, have, have agreed to participate in the LHC program. They've dedicated sufficient resources, significant resources uh, to, to work on this. And what we have, so you basically see there's one in each of the major, uh, major centers uh, for physics around the world. We have grid carriers in uh, Karlsruhe in Germany, Rutherford in the UK, Sarah, uh, Niketh in uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, uh, Fermilab in the US, Triumph in uh, Canada. We have Bologna in Italy, Lyon in France, uh, Barcelona in Spain, uh, Taipei in Taiwan, uh, Brookhaven in the US, and the Nordic data grid facility where the Nordic countries have come together and produced a distributed center across the Nordic countries. So these are what we call our tier one centers. And we have uh, high-speed dedicated links, network links to those 11 centers. And so the data taken at CERN is also sent out to those 11 major tier one centers. They have specific functions. They will also, of course, store another copy, at least one other copy of the data. So now we have the replication of the data uh, in the system. So if we lose one copy at CERN or somewhere else, we've got a copy uh, available. And significant processing capacity as well to actually churn through all that data and analyze the, the physics. Okay? And they also provide another function, which is to service many other regional centers, which we call tier two, tier threes, where the end physicists are often sitting. So that's, these are the guys sitting there, want to get hold of the data, want to analyze it, want to do the work on it. Provide special services to these guys. And um, so that is the whole model that we have. And there's, of course, there's, there's, there's a whole uh, operational mode that goes with this uh, service level agreement about what's provided at each level and so on. And it's completely monitored all the, all the while, 365 days a year. Altogether, um, there's something like 150 regular centers that are working and using and processing and contributing to this data information system. Below that, of course, the networking is, is, is very, very important to us. Uh, much work has been put in place to work with the, the academic networks around the world, so that the national, regional, uh, the national research and educational networks in many of the uh, European countries contribute to helping uh, make this system work. So we have high-speed links uh, between CERN and the major Tier 1 centers. We also have backup links as well. And this proved very important because in 2009, when we were doing basically dry runs for, for the LHC, uh, some of the cables were actually cut, but the system didn't stop. Because of the, uh, the alternative routing, we could continue to process the data at the same rate, or more or less the same rate. So we continued, continued operations. That's very important. We have to be very reliable in that way because we can't switch off the accelerator. We have to keep going. So, as you've seen, it's been running basically for about a year now. 2007 was the year when we took our first major data-taking year. Here are the results um, shown, uh, sort of e event displays from the four major experiments. They're all very happy. That they're, they're gathering data at far better rates than they expected, with far better quality than they originally foreseen at this stage. It's a, it's a fantastic machine, so it takes time to tune it, get used to it, understand it, of course, and the detectors themselves. So they're all very pleased at the rate at which they're doing it. And the data they are visualizing here has been processed and delivered to them via the grid system that we talked about. So if we look at the numbers here, during 2010, we stored, as I said, 15 petabytes of data uh, onto a permanent storage from the LHC experiments. Okay? Uh, 
um, and we are storing at up to rates of 220 pet, uh, terabytes per day during the heavy iron run, which happened in sort of November, early December. Um, at tier zero, so in and out of the computer center, at two gigabits, uh, gigabytes per second with peaks up to 11.5, and the average out is about six with peaks up to 25. So it's a very continuous uh, system. It's not just short bursts, it's continuous operation of the scheme as well. In terms of this processing that goes on inside the, inside the, uh, the grid system, as I said, uh, the physics model were fortunate in the sense that we're talking about individual events, and they can be processed independent of other events. There's no relationship between the events themselves. So you can separate it out, split it out into individual events, package those up into groups, and send them off to different computer centers to be processed. And that's what happens on the grid system uh, at the moment. And of course, they need access to the, to the, uh, to the data to do that. And so at the moment, we're running roughly about 1 million executions, jobs, executions per day. So across those many sites, they're, they're running about 1 million uh, jobs per day, which represents more than 100,000 CPU days per day. Right? So you get an estimate of the amount of compute capacity that we're actually using here. Uh, and at any one time, this is the number of concurrent physicists, users uh, online. So we've got around about 2,000 people at any one time concurrently accessing the data. And the data is distributed around the world within a matter of hours using this tiered scheme that I've just explained. So um, now you've got a sort of a rough idea of what it is, but let me say how we actually got there. Right? We haven't just gone out and bought this system. Unfortunately, we couldn't see it in the catalog anywhere, so we had to build the damn thing. And the way it actually really is, it's a distributed computing infrastructure to provide the production analysis. So it's not only analyzing the data, but all the simulation that goes on beforehand for the, uh, for the experiments. And it's really three major things, a collaboration. There's the collaboration of all these resources being pledged by the different institutes around the world. They have a long-term commitment to the LHC. They've signed memorandum of understanding, and they're giving resources to LHC. There's no money changing hands, right? It's just people say, we want to work on LHC. We are willing to contribute this amount of computing resources and effort to make the thing work, okay? Service, I tried to explain to you a little bit the operation of the system with all these different services in terms of data uh, and the CPU and the networking. That offers a real service which runs 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. And there are service level agreements which are defined. We can't find anybody because they didn't give us any, we haven't, we haven't paid them any money. But what we do is pretty much uh, like many other places now, is we, we, uh, we monitor it continuously, and every month we know the performance of each of the individual sites, and we compare it to what they pledged and so on, and we compare that, and it's either name and shame or name and glory, right, depending where they are on the list. Yeah. So that works quite well. And then, of course, there's the implementation. As I said it's basically a distributed grid system, a collaborative grid system, right, contributing resources. Right? And that's the, that's the technology we have today, right? But as I said, it's basically been designed 10 years ago, and it's been put in place and tuned, made sure it could operate at this rate. Of course, we want to see now things have moved on. How can we evolve that technology um, so that we can change the implementation but still maintain the service and the collaboration? We don't want to lose that. Right? So if you look at that structure in terms of collaboration, framework, or service, and distributed computing, this is basically what it represents today. And at the bottom, you've got the, the iron, right? the hardware, and so on down there. The, the, the sort of distributed model we have above it, the various services that are here, and then the collaboration itself and so on. So what we really want to be able to do somehow is replace this distributed, uh, evolve this distributed computing services into something else moving towards a cloud-style model as well. A lot of the uh, cloud computing one sees now has a lot of similarities and origins in what's happening with the grid computing, so we can see some sort of evolution. We want to go in that way. But still maintain some of the advantages that we've got with the grid system as we move towards that sort of model. So how do we have to evolve this data processing? Well, basically, the thing is to make it sustainable. If you think about the lifetime of the LHC, it's been preparation for 20 years before it saw data, right? uh, and it will run for 15, 20 years as well. So it's a hell of a long time, right? And we need the commitment and make it sustainable. There are going to be many generations of programmers, operators, electricians, physicists, working on this machine, and there's going to be a massive amount of data that's going to be accumulated over the lifetime 
from the machine as well. So we have to be able to make it operate in a sort of an efficient manner that can be sustained. So there are many data issues around that, the whole data management and, and access question. How can we ensure guarantee access to this data on a global scale uh, over, over decades? Uh, how can we make it reliable and fault-tolerant systems when essentially the hardware we're building on is not reliable and fault-tolerant? Many of the centers that we work with, including CERN, we buy commodity systems. We buy low-cost, standard, uh, uh, not gold-plated uh, disks or CPUs, right? And they have failure rates, often higher than the, than the, um, than the manufacturers publish, right? And we have to make a reliable system still depending on those unreliable uh, elements below. The data preservation, as I said, making it for decades and ensuring it's open access and adapt to the changing technologies. When this stuff was designed, it was single CPU servers people have. Um, now you have, there are many, many core CPUs. And who knows? It might be the predominant technology might be GPUs uh, for the whole commodity world in, within the next couple of years. Can our computing model adapt to that? Can our algorithms exploit GPU architectures as efficiently as the, uh, as the uh, single processor technology it was designed for? Things like this. Okay. So we have to adapt to those. Similar thing with global file systems. All the physicists want to be able to see all of the data from their experiment as one big global Unix file system. That's what they want to see. Not that easy to provide in the, uh, during the mid-2000 uh, years on that sort of scale. But now if you look around, there are different services which are making it possible. Things have evolved. Um, and if you think about it logically, well, things like Dropbox, isn't that a global file system? Could we not have something like Dropbox for LHC? Could that not work across all the different centers? Just trying to think of different ways of doing it, things like that. Virtualization. Many of the centers I've talked about are already virtualizing their, their, their computing resources. One of the groups in the IT department is specifically put in place virtual machines uh, with, with Linux flavors, with, uh, with Windows servers, and so on. Um, but can we, can we expand that? Can we get it so that the, the physicists' algorithms are wrapped up as virtual images, which we can then distribute around these different centers and allow people to change and reallocate the resources more dynamically than they can do today? Of course, the networking infrastructure. When this system was simulated and put together, the networks were not particularly reliable, and it, people assumed in the simulation that they would fail. It turns out there's been such progress in the networking layer that it's the most reliable part of the whole system. Right? So that sort of turns on the head the way you have to think about it. Right? Do we still need this tier system? It's a peer model instead be more appropriate now as these technologies have changed, as the structure and the, and, the, and the networking capabilities have changed as well. So all these things we have to try and take into account. But I mean, we have to remember there's people involved in this as well, right? And there's the, the point is when we talk to the physicists now, they say, don't touch it, it works, leave it, it runs, leave it, right? But of course, they want incremental improvements. But if we're going to keep keep the thing going and maintain it for the decade and so, we've got to see how we can do it. And one important point is the data. The biggest area where things are going to change are in the data management and data storage areas. But of course, data essentially, it's the family crown jewels of, of the LHC, right? Think about it. Somebody who started working at CERN in the 90s or 80s, when, when things like Atlas and the LHC were being designed, they've probably been working 15, 20 years at CERN, if they stay for the lifetime of the experiment, that's another 20 years, they spent the whole career on one experiment. Right? So imagine you spent your whole career on the experiment. And at the end of it, somebody says, okay, we're not going to look after your data anywhere else. We're going to give it to someone else in the cloud. Right? How are you going to feel? Right? You know, you've been spending so much, so much of your life trying to get this data. Are you prepared to give it to somebody else at the moment to manage it? Right? So we have to get over that issue. We've got to assure them that it is possible that we can guarantee access to the data and that it will be around and they will have access to it. Okay? Okay. There's the whole question of, if we go into this cloud model, public versus private cloud, you could argue that what we have today is a private cloud. It's open to the people inside the LHC community. They can share the data between them. They can share the resources and so on. But we're not paying anybody money. We're not paying a separate, an outside company to run that. However, in the future, you might want to do that. So that we could consider that a public, a public cloud system. Each one of these situations are a couple of things we have to think about from a legal point of view. Who has access to it? Depending where your data is residing, it falls under different national jurisdictions. And different governments have different rules about what they can do with that data. Do they have the right to access it or not? That we have to take into account. Does it match with the collaborations being put in place for physics and so on? 
well in terms of the public clouds. What are the terms and conditions of the service? When you read the, get the contract and you sign it and you read the fine print, does it actually offer you all the guarantees you need? What's the service level quality that you're actually going to get for your money and so on? So there's a couple of references there you can see at the bottom of a good, good report. But those are things that are going on in the thinking of people at the moment, trying to understand how can we profit from these advances in this technology but still ensure that we can serve the community in the best possible way. And, of course, if, if, any, if we do go in this direction and we start using public clouds, nobody's going to use a single cloud, are they? Like taking a single disk supplier or a dingle, single CPU supplier. You're not going to take just one because if they collapse, what happens to your data? Hmm? Cloud, you're going to have several of them. And if you have several of them, what standards exist? Can you move your data between one cloud system and the other? If one company goes bust, can you take it out and move it somewhere else? Can you play them off the market forces and things like that? All those questions come into play. And also, what about identity? Well, at the moment, we have a federated identity system across all of those centers. Using X509 certificates, you're given a certificate by your host organization. And with that, you can go and access the resources on any one of those machines. Right? In the case, if we have different cloud systems around, can you use your same identity across all these things? This is going to be very important for us. Nobody wants to keep logging into these different things. right? So those are some of the things we were working on and trying to understand how we can address at the moment. If we come back now, collapse, go from the global view and come back and look just at CERN, right, the computer center. This is sort of, uh, I should point out that the CERN computer center, while relatively big by research standards, is for 20% of the computing resources which are consumed by the LHC. The majority of it is actually coming from the other centers. Right? The tier two centers, which, which appeared on that graph, the tier two and tier three, as the small guys at the end, they're actually providing the majority of the computing resources, 60% on average, comes from those small tier two and tier three centers. And CERN itself, as I said, only provides 20% uh, of it. We can't possibly put it all in one center. Originally, because of, um, let's say, funding issues, CERN is funded by all these member states. The member states would rather than give us extra money to build a massive computer center at CERN, they'd rather keep the money and invest it locally in their own countries which is easier for politicians to do than to give it to some other country or some other place, right? Invest it locally and then use it as well for other sciences, not just for physics, right? And of course, so we have to build that into the model that we use as well. Okay. If you look at it now, these numbers are about three months old, something like that, so it's continuously growing, right? But we have about 8,000 servers, 13,000 processors in the, in the computer center there with about 50,000 cores. The spec inst, don't worry about that, that's a certain specific, uh, high physics specific uh, measurement. And there's about uh, something over 50,000 disks there as well. And you see that, you know, there's continuous generations, different generations of the hardware. We don't buy it all at once, of course, like any other center. We're buying different generations, trying to get the best bang for your, for your buck, so, so to speak, in terms of CPU capacity and so on, and networking uh, facilities. So, of course, there are many generations of the hardware in the computer center at one time. We have to manage those points as well. Continuous uh, breakdowns of the equipment, disks, um, power supplies, the most... Uh, most uh, weakest parts we have there in terms of failures. And of course, we have, as I said, tapes. We have about 150, 160 tape drives uh, uh, with, the, with the robots from, uh, from IBM and Sun Storage Tech. There's about 45 petabytes of tape storage uh, there at the moment. And then you see the sort of networking capacity that we have inside the computer center. This computer center is quite an old building. It's not, not nice and new like this lovely building we're in today. It dates back from 1972. And it's about five megawatts in power. It has a, a power to utility efficiency of about 1.7. So we're, we're using almost as much again in terms of cooling and for ancillary uses rather than actually the sort of CPU cycles you get out. If we, if we want to improve those numbers, we need to have a new setup for the computer center. And CERN itself at the moment is looking to have a remote tier zero, finding some other country in Europe who is willing to provide a new computer center for us where we can put extra capacity in as well. But if you look at the computer center itself, this is roughly sort of the numbers game of what's happening at the moment. From the experiments, we get about 700 megabytes per second. It comes into the, into the CASA system where we have the disk, uh, disk pools, which are basically the front cache to the, uh, to the tape systems as well. There, the cleverest CASA software decides when it goes out to the tape service. Uh, here, we're talking about less than the half a second access time. With the tape service, we're talking minutes before going in and getting out of data. But it isn't just archiving the tape system. We're actually using really as an active, an active part of the hierarchical management system. In the future, who knows? We'll see how things evolve there as well, right? 
And then from the analysis, the algorithms are being run on the sort of the on, on the servers and so on. Uh, uh, then, then accessing the data here as well. And of course, it's read backwards and forwards here. And then, of course, pumping data out to the tier one centers at those sort of rates as well. Okay. In terms of the, uh, the sort of data management layers, well, from the end physicist user, he's got a sort of a popular package they use is called Root, sort of an object-oriented framework for analyzing the physics data. They can plug in their algorithms, do cuts, fits, and so on, see graphs and so on out of that. Uh, access the file systems through a network client down to the network server, the namespace, so it looks like a big file system if you want, to the disks from the disk staging area uh, and the scheduler down to the tape systems and offline storage. So that's basically what the whole model looks like inside the, inside the tier zero. So in specifically in the data management area, is that likely to, to remove? Well, is can we take an approach where we move more of the scale of performance and reliability issues to a software layer? We're counting very much on the hardware at the moment. Can we change that? Can we make it more a more uh, service-oriented software layer in that sense as well? Looking at the question of scalability, we need to store at least 20 petabytes per year. The physicists are running faster than we are. Um, the accelerator is getting better every day. The energy, the luminosity is going up. The detectors are getting better. They're understanding better their machines, tuning them better, understanding how they can work better. So that's increasing it. 20 Petabytes per year is looking conservative now for what's going to happen. And so, of course, over the lifetime of LHC, we're talking exabyte scale. Security, of course, we need fine grain access control to all the different uh, files where we store multiple events and so on. And also, we need uh, multiple authentic authentication systems, um, not just X509 certificates. We need different ways of uh, integrating different systems there as well. The accounting and journaling, that's very important. We have monitoring and logging uh, systems at the moment, but we can't really roll them back and restart as we would like to. Uh, global access accessibility, basically all data has to be accessible to anybody in the world that has an internet connection. The bottom line of what we have to be able to do. Sounds funny to you guys, I'm sure. As well. And then the manageability, sort of how can we limit the interventions that are needed in the computer centers? How can we do it at the moment? There are engineers going in on call 24 hours a day and making sure that the hardware is performing correctly, right? Can we change that so we can limit it just to office hours and only using technician level uh, people to do it by making better use of the software layers and so on? What can we do in terms of sort of the multiple and various levels of service quality? At the moment, there's one level of quality. That's it for the LHC, right? Can we have multiple levels? Can we vary them according to what the needs are, what we can afford, things like this as well? Then I said as well, we're sort of trying to do all this with low-cost hardware, right? Commodity low-cost hardware where price is the, is the gaming factor. And, of course, the power efficiency question, everybody has to be efficient with, uh, with energy now. What can we do? Can we, can we turn off disks and manage, them, uh, manage the power for them? With many core CPUs, can we shut down some of, the, some of the cores? What can we do in that sort of area as well? What I want to say as well, just finish off with the idea that everything we're doing here is not just specifically for physics, right? As I said, it's a general purpose grid system evolving into a cloud system. The data management issues are very, very important. And this uh, European um, Commission organized high-level group of export, experts put out a vision for scientific data where basically you don't see the infrastructure anymore, you just see the data. And that's valid for many of the scientific disciplines. At CERN, we have strong relationships with people working in health systems, uh, life sciences, drug discovery is, uh, is a big user of these grid information, uh, grid, uh, grid systems as well. Similarly, in, um, in the environmental sciences and earth sciences, processing the satellite data. We know a lot about that stuff as well. A lot of that is done with UNOSAT here at, uh, at CERN as well. And so all of these sciences are looking at this, uh, at this question as well and thinking that there might be some common elements in what we can do here. And so there's a basic model that people are evolving towards. You know, this is very, very... You can, any software system you can break into three layers. We can all do that, right? But if, if you... Um, if, if you look at the basic services people are trying to provide here, those are sort of things which we can map onto what we have today and what we want. And, of course, the whole question of continuous trust across all of those layers and the data curation as well. Just finish there and say thank you very much for your attention. One from Grant, who, came, who uh, contacted me yesterday from Seattle. He read your 2007 paper on data corruption at the LHC. And he's wondering if you have any follow-up. I can remember what paper that was. <laughs> uh, data corruption. We have... Um, okay. Anybody familiar with that paper? Otherwise, I will stab at it. 
okay, well, look, I'll guess at it <laughs> while you're doing that. So corruption can happen at many layers in this system. First of all, from the experimental cells in the, in the, in the, in the electronics level, right? And that's why we run a lot of, a lot of time is spent with cosmic, cosmic rays when the accelerator isn't running. They're actually testing the electronics in the, uh, in the detectors to see if they are actually producing the data that's expected, right, the right quantities, seeing if different parts of the detector are dead or alive. Because when you assemble this thing, there's zillions of miles of, of cables in them. And yes, and sometimes you don't connect them correctly. Right? Then, of course, there's a triggering data acquisition system itself, which may have hardware errors. It may have uh, software failures. It may have problems in the algorithm. It may be throwing away good data, right? which is uh, one of the issues for the experiment. And one of the reasons, for example, at the start, when they, they start up, they, they run with rather loose triggering algorithms because they want to make sure that they're not losing anything important. Is the, there's the distributed system itself. Now, uh, in terms of that, yes, we, can, we could potentially lose data, but as I explained, we have replication of data. That's very important. We use a lot of the Oracle facilities there as well to actually distribute and have replicas across CERN and the Tier 1 systems. And um, in terms of the, the jobs which are running and processing that data, if any one of those jobs fails, they are monitored. The experiments know about it, and the job is either restarted automatically by our resource broker, or the, uh, the experiment framework, software framework itself will capture that and reschedule it themselves. So those, those systems, some fault tolerance built into all those systems, but we can't guarantee 100% on all. In the diagrams, you mentioned uh, people getting access to the data at the, the tier two, or whichever tier it was, of the, uh, yeah. the users at the other end, the physicists. As a physicist, ask for data? Do they ask for a time slice? Do they ask for specific interactions of particles? Do they ask for specific experiments? And Do they get the data or do they simply uh, request that their algorithm is run against that data somewhere else asynchronously and then have the results sent back to them? Okay, so there's, there's different aspects to this. One is, first of all, um, the collaborations have a uh, a body of users, the physicists, right? They're all working, contributing to that experiment. And they have, all have access to that data, right? But that doesn't mean people from one experiment have access to another experiment. Remember I said they're in competition, right? So they're, they're working to do something together. So they have access control over who can see the latest data coming out of the experiments, okay? In terms of requesting that data, typically what happens when they're reprocessing the data, they are generating... Um, summary information of, from the raw data. So they're reconstructing the tracks, uh, the different characteristics of the, uh, of the event, different particles and so on. And that data is also written to storage. That's why the amount of data actually gets written to the storage is more than the data that's re initially recorded on the, on the disks and so on. So when they're doing their analysis through things like raw, uh, root and so on, they're not actually looking at the raw data initially. They're looking at a, basically on a statistical basis. They're looking at the summary information doing fits and cuts on that summary information. Yes, sometimes they're looking over a period. And for each run, there's specific what they call calibration data from each of the experiments. And that records basically lots of characteristics about what did the detector look like when we took that data. Right? Um, is how many of the channels were on, off? Were the different subsystems working? Uh, what was the timing situation uh, across the whole detector and things like that? So they bring all those pieces together. And if the if the characteristics are correct, along with the beam characteristics are correct for the type of phenomenon they're trying to look for, they will bring, narrow down the amount of data they want and do their analysis based on that uh, principle. Um, so the um, question is, so basically when you're talking about these uh, layers of uh, process information, so you mentioned this uh, very first layer, which is responsible for removing like extra information which is not interesting, okay? So for example, like if uh, 10 years, I don't know, uh, physics like a new uh, a model or something, going to look for new like uh, I don't know, particles with new properties. So you do you need like uh, change this hardware layer completely, or you can reprogram it? Uh, well, there's, there's, there's two ways you can look at that. Right? The triggering layers, all the way from trigger trigger level one, uh, two, and uh, one and two. At that point, we haven't permanently recorded this, the data. Then is lost forever. Right? That's gone. Yeah. It's gone into, into mass storage. We have access to that data. 
with so, under certain conditions. You know, I talked about the calibration data and so on for the for the experiments. What could happen, you're quite right, is that later people come back and say, okay, I want to look at that data uh, again because I want to apply some other algorithm to it. Right? They can do that, but you can't change the conditions under which that data was recorded. Right? It's done. That's passed here. Yeah? You can, and this is done dynamically, and it's uh, part of the, the online system for each of the experiments, uses some of its CPU time resources to do this. It can monitor in real time what's happening in the experiment and make some adjustments to how the experiment is configured. Okay? Um, but it's, it's short term that they're doing that. Right? Now, in the lifetime of the LHC, what's expected is that we're running basically at, at 7 TeV now, so two beams of 3.5 uh, TeV. It's designed to go up to, 70, uh, up to 14 TeV, so two beams of 7 TeV. But there are then plans as well to upgrade the, uh, the LHC to the super LHC. So this will uh, imply uh, improvements uh, in the technology around the, some of the magnets, uh, the radio frequency uh, cavities and so on, uh, and the kicker systems to improve the quantity of data and the quality of data we're getting out of the, um, out of the accelerator. Consequently, there will be upgrades to some of the experiments. For example, CMS and Atlas are looking at upgrading some of their systems as well. Uh, at that point, we can start looking at other characteristics, which at the moment may be out of the visible range of what we can see with the LHC today. Okay, another question that I was sent was around network availability stats for long-haul links, uh, the ones that CERN operates particularly. Um, they were wondering where things are failing if that isn't 100%. Um, okay, I'm going to hand this over to the networking guys. They probably know better than me. I guess a lot of the fake fellows are guys with diggers <laughs> <laughs> and ships, anchors, and earthquakes. Yeah. 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 Yes, there's one particular case when there was the earthquake in Asia, which cut off some of our links, uh, a lot of the links, not just for CERN, but around uh, Taiwan. Uh, but as I said, because we have the redundancy links, we can, in most cases, we can carry on processing. So. so you said these experiments are in competition, but you're sort of distributing the data over all these different sites, do you encrypt the data when you send it out, or do you do something to hide it, or no? Um, we have the access control mechanism, so this, uh, the X509-based certificate system, so to access the data, you need those, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you ask the physicists, they will tell you, we don't need to encrypt it, and it isn't encrypted, because nobody can understand the damn stuff anyway. Um, <laughs> so and it's true, unless you're really working on one of the experiments, being able to interpret, it, interpret that data is very difficult. Um, there aren't that many manuals. About, uh, about the physics data itself. Yeah. How do you handle contention for resources? Ah, yeah, that, that's a very good question. As I said, there's, um, you have to remember that, that CERN's responsible for building the accelerators and running the accelerator facilities. Right? The experiments don't belong to us. Right? They are built by separate, uh, separate groups that, first of all, compete on paper to be given the right to actually build an experiment and have access to the, to the accelerator. And when it's built, they have a collaboration. They have a, an agreement between themselves what they're going to do. Now, many of these centers that appear in the, in the, in the grid are serving multiple experiments. You know, research institutes like to, like to hedge their bets as well, right? So they're going to work on more than one experiment. And they say themselves how they want to allocate their resources. We do not impose it on anybody. What we do from the CERN point of view is that we monitor it in the sense of we monitor what they pledge, to verify that what the centers are providing are adequate for the experiment. So if we find that for one particular experiment there isn't enough resources, we raise alarm bells. We can't force them to give it, but we raise alarm bells, and typically the, the, the centers themselves will, will do something to try and accommodate that. Right? But the relative priorities between them is, is, a, is a decision for each of the resource centers themselves. Right? Typically they can do it different ways. Uh, it, look, most of them are, have got a batch system running. Um, so they will give different cues for different priorities uh, to different experiments and things like that.